Dennis, hello. Okay, I think we're we're live now. So I'll start chatting then, should I? Um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this live stream seminar event. It's part of the virtual INI program on the uh, <coughs> infectious dynamics of pandemics. If I've got my words in the right order. I'm David Abrahams. I'm the director of the Isaac Newton Institute and it's my great pleasure to sort of kick off this formal part of the, the day's workshop which is part of a four-month virtual program. So I'd just like to say a couple of words to thank um, everybody who's involved in the, been involved in the setting up of the program. It's taken a lot of people uh, working very hard in a very short amount of time. So the Institute's been running for about 27 years now, and its job is to further mathematical sciences research across the whole gamut of the subject from the very pure to the very applied. And we run large programs, so typically four or six months long, um, with many workshops and incorporating many people involved in the running and audience of these events. Um, it means that because they're large, large activities, they usually take two and a half or three years to construct. This one has been constructed in about three weeks. And the scale of all of our programs is such that they are there for the long term. The Institute makes a difference over decades or, or centuries even. But we see this event as being something that could have a very, very profound impact. And it has a unique role with uh, a large uh, participant base of making a difference with all of the activity that's going on around the world within infectious disease modeling. So I think we have a special angle and hopefully we will have the resource and the ability to put on a program which is as close to being a physical program based in our building as possible, but being um, run virtually. And over the months, we may feel, feel that we can actually do a better job than we've been able to do in the past and learn something. But um, I just want to say thank you for being um, participants. Thank you if you're listening to us via live streaming. And I hope in time that we will get, um, get um, more able to put on events at the drop of a hat and you will get more information um, as to what we're doing. So we'll keep you posted. But by all means, drop me an email or Deirdre or Valerie or Dennis, the principal organizers of this event in coming um, weeks and months. Um, so thank you. With that, I'll just um, thank our speaker, Graham. I'll thank our principal organizer, Deirdre, for working so hard with the rest of her team to set it up. And I wish you all success with the program. So over to you, Deirdre. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And I really, on behalf of the organising committee, I would like to thank David and the Isaac Newton Institute for stimulating and hosting this programme and also for being so hugely supportive, as you described, in getting it off the ground so quickly in this virtual way. As we know, for COVID modelling, infectious disease modelling has rarely been so prominent in public consciousness. And Therefore, alongside all of the very hard work that's been done modeling coronavirus, it was important that the Isaac Newton Institute provide a space and time for modelers to think about the broader questions. And as you mentioned, looking forward, how can we learn from this current situation for future pandemics, but also that this is an opportunity to bring in other expertise into our field from a broad range of different scientific and social science areas. And that's something we're looking to address over the next few weeks. However, the real hot uh, topic is how modeling can inform policy uh, in real time during this pandemic. And with that in mind, it's a real pleasure to introduce our opening lecturer, Professor Graham Medley from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He has a very broad track record in modelling for policy. And that was why he was selected as chair of the UK's main policy uh, advisory group on modelling, uh, SPY-M as it's called. And he has used his chairmanship 
of that uh, board to sort of manage a diverse number of modeling groups and provide his really unique insight on the role of modeling for policy. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Graham, and thank you very much for your time. And we'll look forward to your thoughts on the role of modeling in the current pandemic. Thank you very much indeed, Deirdre. Um, so I, I'm, I've got some slides. I haven't had an enormous amount of time to prepare this talk, so I apologize um, in advance for um, uh, the fact that I, I don't really know how long it's going to take, but we'll see how it goes. Um, and I believe that somebody is going to put the slides up. Um, thank you very much. So I'm going to say something briefly about the current situation. Um, the COVID-19 epidemic is still very new. It started, uh, as I think we all know, um, in China um, late last year. Um, and has grown now to it to be a pandemic and infect um, the whole of the the whole of the world largely i'm going to focus mostly on the uk because that's where i i know uh, um, most about but but whatever ha what is happening in the uk is being replicated elsewhere as well um so i am the chair of spiem this this enigmatic committee the spiem is um stands for Science Pandemic Influenza hyphen modeling. And when I was invited to chair this back in 2017, I do have to say that one of the reasons that I was interested in doing it was just because of the name. Uh, and the sec one of the members of the Secretariat offered to hum the um, James Bond theme tune every time I, I started chairing a meeting. The main point of that committee in between pandemics is to prepare for the next pandemic um, and so we already had a quite a good idea other members had, had been lived through different pandemics um, so we already had quite a good idea of what would happen but of course the, in the theory um, is very different from the practice uh, and i believe i should be able to change slides but i don't quite know how i can do that Right, if I say next slide, can that? Thank you very much. So my short term forecast um, for, for this talk is that I'm gonna say a little bit about how the policy science interface works in terms of modeling for COVID-19 in U UK at the moment. Um, a little bit about what, what modelling for policy entails um, uh, and the role of modelling. I'm going to spend a little bit of time just thinking aloud about what model structures we're missing. What is it that we, we would like to have done in between the last pandemic and this one? And then a word or two about where I think we are in terms of the epidemiology and, and, and where we're going. I'm not going to go into the disease details. There is a very good uh, lecture by the Chief Medical Officer, um, Chris Whitty, available on YouTube, which um, uh, some of you will find and we can, we can put the link, which is a very good summary of our current understanding of the epidemiology, of the, the clinical features of the disease. And I'm not, I'm not going to go into those. I'm, I'm going to presume that we all have, you all have some understanding of the basics um, of COVID-19. Um, and as he says at the beginning of his lecture, we know that this disease is so new that the things that we think we understand now are going to be wrong. Um, so I'm undoubtedly going to say things um, during the course of this lecture um, which turn out to be um, untrue or potentially uh, misleading, um, for which I, I can't and I can't and I won't apologize. Um, because that's just the state of what happens during pandemics. Oops, I want to go back. Thank you. So this is how the modeling is organized. So SPIM has now become SPIMO. So when SAGE is set up, SAGE is the scientific advisory group for emergencies when that's set up 
at the beginning of a pandemic, SPY M, which normally reports to the Deputy Chief Medical Officer in the Department of Health and Social Care, gets transferred to be a subcommittee of SAGE. And SAGE, as you know, has um, the government chief scientific advisor, the CMO, representative of PHE, uh, Public Health England, Office of National Statistics, etc., all on that committee. Uh, and SPIMO feeds into that committee. And as the chair of SPIMO, I sit on SAGE. Various other subcommittees feed in, so Nerve Tag, which is um, expert in the virology. We now have a hospital onset um, group, um, and SPI B, which is looking at behavioral aspects, all feed into SAGE. And, and our job on these subcommittees is to develop the evidence. So we're looking for to gather the scientific evidence to present that to SAGE, and then SAGE uses that to create the advice which goes up through the civil service eventually to the ministers who make the decisions. SPIMO has got representatives. There was a, um, a meeting this morning. I think there are of the order of 60 people uh, on those calls. Not all of them are participating actively. Um, lots of people listening across government uh, quite rightly to find out what it is that we think of the evidence and the strength of that evidence. Um, and this listed there are the names of the organizations that, that people join us from um, and the, the names themselves, apart from two who have declined not to be named, but the names themselves are available on the Go Science website if, if you want to uh, see who they are. But um, they are a fantastic group of people who've contributed a huge amount of time and effort in order to generate this, this scientific evidence. And one of the things I'd like to do in this lecture is to acknowledge the role of Bob May in development of this subject, but also in development of understanding of the way in which science and policy should interact. And, and we can remember Bob May in two ways. One of his is contribution scientifically and, and to policy, which, which was huge. But then we can also remember him in terms of the numerous anecdotes that he's left behind. And one in particular strikes me as I look at this list, which is that um, somebody had once said that you should always try and um, collaborate with people who are more intelligent than you are. Uh, and Bob May apparently said, yes, well, that's easier for some people than others. Uh, and in this case, it's extremely easy for me because uh, the, the talent and the expertise on, on SPIMO um, is, is outstanding. Makes my job a lot easier, makes my job possible. Of course, as soon as the pandemic starts, and especially as organisations such as universities begin to close down, there's an awful lot of very clever numerate people who are left wondering what it is possibly that the modelers could be doing that could take them so long uh, to produce modeling evidence. Um, and I was and others were received lots of emails during that period of time, um, sort of during, during March, um, from people who, for example, were running large complex individual based models who would send me an email saying, what you need is a large complex individual based model to solve the problem. This is something which I thought, well, then we need somehow to ch channel this talent. And so um, I was very happy to get a call from um, um, Mike Katz at, at Cambridge, who said, would it be sensible to set up something, um, a channel for this talent? And so RAMP, which many of you will know, is set up by the Royal Society, has been a fantastic organization, enormous support for the members of, of SPY-M um, in finding people with, with particular levels of expertise to join in. Um, and we are continually looking for ways to make the route to which we can expand um, the, the input into creating the scientific evidence um, to, to help manage COVID um, can feed into, in, it's um, been hopefully something that will continue to grow. So we know at the beginning of any pandemic that we're facing a virus for which we have very imperfect information. 
and we're expecting that information to develop over time initially slowly but exponentially the data accrues exponentially but it's because of that gap where we don't know what's going to happen and we don't know necessarily what is happening and yet policy has to be made that that we have this uncertainty in, in what it is that should be advised so modeling becomes extremely important in that gap because it it apparently creates the evidence that people need to think about to make policy. Now, because of that, in the preparedness document that SPIAM produces, has produced, um, we, we, we kind of lay down the basic principles of what we need to do during the early stages of, of a pandemic, because in that period of great uncertainty, I don't want to use the word panic, but, but there is a lot of people running around saying, well, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. Uh, and, and so there's a kind of rule book, a playbook, if you like, of no, this is in that period when we don't know what to do. Um, modeling will be impos impossible because we won't have detailed data on what COVID does in the United Kingdom. We, will, we, have, we saw it in other countries on the way in. Um, but we didn't know what it was going to do in the United Kingdom. We didn't have those data streams that, that we knew would, we would have. And so in that period of uncertainty, we'd like to do the modeling beforehand, um, um, be, be, before we can actually start to address specific policies. When we do start to have data streams, and we do start to understand more about what the disease is doing uh, in the United Kingdom, then models play this central role. They sit between the data and the policy. So models in, that, in this sense are really no more than data interpretation tools to be able to say, well, what is it that's going on? What is the estimate of the basic reproduction number? What is the estimate of the doubling time, which we can gather from the data? And then that feeds into um, discussions about what you're going to do about it. One of the things that we didn't write down, which I think has now become very apparent to me, is that we, we are where we are. And in terms of, of the early stages of the epidemic, there's no point in looking back and saying, well, what if? What if we'd done this? What if we'd done that? Not to say that other people shouldn't do it, but I think in terms of people who, who are actually working with the data and working uh, in terms of deciding what it is that might be done tomorrow, um, looking back to say, well, if only we had done something different, um, isn't, isn't particularly helpful in that process itself. The other thing we know about pandemics and, and you know, the number of, of pandemics we've seen, starting with HIV in my case, so, so that was my first pandemic. Um, we know that that new novel pathogens, if they're going to be successful and to establish themselves and to spread um, to many countries, many populations, they will find new heterogeneities or, or, or novel combinations of old heterogeneities in which to um, propagate through the population. Core groups are always important and they're perhaps essential. So a core group is, is those people who are more likely to be infected are more likely to infect. Uh, and, and you kind of, I, th I think I, I'm kind of making this up as I go along, but I think that for any infectious disease to be, um, to be, to be able to, to propagate into a population, to be able to become a pandemic, it has to find core groups. It means that R is always bigger at the start of an epidemic, so the basic reproduction number, which is a measure of the average number of secondary cases from each primary case, is always bigger because the, the infection goes through those core groups initially. But core groups will change, so we have to watch that during the course of, of the epidemic. Um, R will change because of the different groups are getting infected at different times. Uh, and the infection is always going to find, eventually, when it, if, if it becomes endemic, but, but even during the, the epidemic phase, uh, what somebody once called the dim corners of society. So those, those people who are less easy to intervene on and less easy to discover what's going on in terms of the epidemiology and less easy to control for whatever reason, 
um, those are going to going to be especially problematic. They're going to be to some extent core group and to some extent far e less easy to manage. The biggest surprise though of this disease, this pandemic has, has not been the fact that, that this epidemic has found different heterogeneities and different combinations of heterogeneities and, and has found its way into, into groups with, in, in this case, the highest deprivation or the lowest socio, socioeconomic um, status. That might have been expected. The biggest surprise so far of this pandemic has been the public health response. If you look at the SPY-M preparedness document, nowhere does it talk about lockdown, nowhere does it talk about a nationally coordinated reduction in contact rates, um, aside from closing schools. Um, and, and as, as you know, a much overused words, but as well, but this really does have no precedent nationally, let alone to be repeated globally. And, and I'm guessing at some point um, in the in re very recent past, pretty much every school in the world was closed uh, as a response um, to COVID. And this is why. This is what we know about, or a little something in what we know about. Um, the way in which respiratory diseases are, are spread. Kind of theory is really very much centered around households. So households represented by those boxes across the middle of the slide. So one of the things that we, we haven't done in the UK, although they have done in South Korea, is to break up households. So during this current period that we've, we've been in, we've asked people to stay at home in other countries, people who are infectious, uh, infected have asked not to go home. We haven't done that. Home we regarded as being the, the, the place within which transmission occurs. Um, and so what we're interested in then is breaking up the transmission network between households. Yeah. And, and those are really principally kind of three routes. We know that, that people will pass transmission at work. And so work transmission goes between work colleagues back to different households. And we know that transmission occurs in schools so that transmission passes from household to household through schools. And, and most of the models that we have, all of the models that we have, represent that kind of network really very well. Yeah, the work household school is that that those kind of layers are really very well understood and as i said in the past we we've known most about how to break those networks by closing schools you know, so that um closing schools is relatively easy it can be done relatively simply and of course if you close schools then people can't go so it kind of circumvents a lot of the behavioral aspects and if you close schools, then a lot of people who would otherwise go to work can't go to work because they have to stay home and look after their schools. So it's a very effective way of breaking up networks. But I don't think anyone has ever suggested that we close work to break those networks before. We also know that people spend a lot of their time in leisure and there are three bars on the bottom right hand side of that screen sort of showing what people do in, in their leisure time, some, some aspects. And I think I'm right in saying that none of the models that we have include any of those explicitly. We know that a, what proportion of time people spend um, in these leisure activities, gyms or bars or personal care, which including hairdressers. So we know, we know that people do go to those, but we don't have any really very good data on the networks that those activities create how they relate to different households, how they relate to different workplaces, um, and how they, they might relate to schools. Um, and, and that degree of those correlations of degree and those, those kind of close networks that are formed are gonna be very important. And our experience of looking at, at over what, what has happened in other countries suggests that those activities, those leisure activities are things that we really are going to have to kind of collect some information about and include those in in this network um, if we want to get an idea of 
of when, for example, in the United Kingdom, we're going to be able to open pubs, um, then we're going to really have to understand how people might use them. The other group of, of three things that are in the top right hand of the slide, the hospital, social care and prisons really sort of represents those institutions which, again, we don't really include very well in these networks. So in the, in the current measures that we've closed down, or tried to reduce as much as possible contacts that, that, that create these networks. Um, is, is that, for example, that in key workers, so those people whose jobs are regarded as being essential, including healthcare workers and social care workers, have not been isolated at home. And so that part of the network has carried on. Um, but we don't know much about that part of the network. We don't know how much it interacts with each other. With each other. And likewise, there are large institutions um, like prisons, um, for which, again, we have very little understanding of, of the networks that, that they create, um, both internally, but also externally as well. So again, they're structures that are missing um, from, from the current models. What we do know is that the, in the, the, the future, in terms of, of how we go from the situation we're in now to kind of rewiring these networks, you know, is, is the thing that, that is going to have to be done very carefully. So we know that the, we have these kind of six degrees of separation, that what we're trying to do is to, is to as much as possible, allow people to go back to school and allow people to go back to work without creating some huge giant component that allows the virus to be transmitted um, in a few jumps um, to, to everybody, a few, a few chains, chains of relatively short length to everybody in the United Kingdom. So in terms of the next pandemic, one thing I, I think we would like to be able to hand on to the kind of next generation of modelers is a really good theory about dynamic networks. There's, there's a quite a lot of good theory about static networks, but some, I, some really good idea about how networks get um, changed and created in real time and networks that include place as well as contact. So it's, it's again, I think relatively clear from looking at the epidemiology of this disease is that place is, is, is just as important uh, and the setting and the environment of that place as the contact. And so some networks theory that in, includes places where people go and make contact in some dynamic framework, and I'm, and I'm not a mathematician, so I'm, I'm not capable of, of kind of putting that into um, mathematical modeling requirements, but dynamic networks I know is something we could really do with. A lot of discussion about the geography, do we need geographically specific networks? And, and I think we will, um, but just as important as the social geography, if you like. The fact that personally, how I have more connection with um, sort of towns where my have friends and relations living that that might be sixty or seventy miles away from here, than I do with um, the local local town because I'm making contacts with those people preferentially. Um, then the social aspects of of these networks, I think, is is probably just as important as the geographical aspect. Um, aspects. So as these networks get rewired in the coming weeks, uh, they, the geography is not going to be uh, necessarily as important as this kind of social geography, if, if, if you like. We're moving into a phase in which the numbers of cases is reducing. Um, in the kind of the, the, the past um, two or three months, we've been thinking about models in terms of their um, kind of very deterministic models, mass action models, things happening very quickly with large numbers of cases. 
if we're successful in, in maintaining a reduction in transmission, then we're going to move towards a situation where stochastic effects are going to be much more important. We're going to be looking at outbreaks um, rather than a, a sort of large scale epidemic. Then we're going to be worried again about this social geography. So where are these outbreaks going to occur? With what frequency? With what size? Um, and as I say, across the kind of social geography. In this process, we are, of course, worried very much about data. Where are we going to get the data from? What's the source of that data? What, what is it that we should be measuring? Uh, and so I think the kind of adaptive management approach or the value of information approach is going to be increasingly important. It would be great if we could use the modeling to be able to say to Public Health England and other people, right, you, you have this number of tests or you have this capacity to be able to collect this information. This is the information that's going to be absolutely crucial uh, in the next coming, coming um, um, weeks. Um, so go and collect that data above all else. We're, at the moment, we're having to do that, but we're having to do it um, by making um, educated guesswork and intuition and experience uh, rather than being able to do it in some kind of semi-formal way, at least, to be able to then know what we're going to do with that information. And of course, as always happens, when you gather some data, all it does is tell you how you, how you should properly have gathered it um, and, uh, and what, else, what other data you need. Um, and and it, something, some way of, of, bit of knowing that pathway through the epidemic, I think, would be, would be extremely useful to the next, to the next one. The other thing, although there are people who very ably considered real time, doing things in real time, it is something which deserves more thought. Um, we're using models to try and address a current problem, and I'll say a bit more about the time constraints of, of, of doing this for policy, but it really has to be done in real time. And, and that is itself an art because what you have to face is the fact that, that reporting delays, again, something that which is very important back in the world of HIV and, and I thought would largely have been addressed, but they are a huge issue in terms of understanding what it is that's going on now, rather than what it is that was going on last week or last month. Likewise, missing data. We've, although the data streams are working, although the people understand the importance of the data. Nonetheless, you're asking people to collect data in the face of a very large epidemic. So many of the data streams immediately are missing. You know, when, date, when, when data, for example, is coming in on patients, um, then age, basic information such as age, occupation, whatever, is often missing from those data quite reasonably. Uh, because the people in the intensive care unit are more worried about saving the life than they are in filling out the form or, or entering the data properly. Again, that's, that's really something which you can foresee happening. So some way of thinking about that, either better and more efficient way of gathering the data, um, or, or better ways in, in which we can deal with the missing data, I think would be, um, is again something that, that needs careful attention. Viral genomics are going to be increasingly important. Um, there's something which um, I know a lot of information being covered, a lot of thought being given to it, um, but I'm, I'm guessing that there can always be more. Um, and then finally, just in terms of thinking about what models are going to be needed um, and what we don't really have is, is this way of being able to think about or measure dynamic networks as they're being formed and to some extent this is just as much a problem in data gathering as it is in terms of model structure. Um, you know, there are various ways in which people are thinking about gathering data but because it's all being done uh, in real time, people are designing the studies you know, and, and designing the, the way in which data are going to be analysed as we're going along, it's going to be very useful and very important, I think, to look at that process and look to see what we end up with and, and inevitably to be able to look back and say, well, this is the way we should have done it. Um, let's do it that way next time.
So modeling for policy is something which I have been involved in for, for a lot of my career, but I've never done it in this kind of intensity. Of course, what you think you need to do is to remember that you're focusing on a given question to a large extent. You do have some flexibility to be able to turn round to decision makers and say, well, that's actually, that's the wrong question. Um, but by and large, you are addressing a given question with whatever models and data are available. And, and often that means that you're not doing the best job that you know you could if you had more time, but you're trying to do a job which gives you um, the right answer, or not the right answer, to gives you gives an answer which is going to be potentially useful. You know, a, a half good answer given before the decision is made is is a um, infinitely more useful than a perfect answer given after the decision is made. And that is, I think, something which um, generally people who are involved in academic science struggle um, to deal with, um, but it has to be done. Science and policy use completely different languages and completely different approaches um, to addressing decisions and addressing problems. So I find that a lot of what I do is translation that I talk to um, people who are asking questions not not the decision makers but the people who are kind of filtering those questions to really work out what the policy question means in terms of something that can be modeled and then when the model is um, modeling has been done is then to help them convert that back into something which can be understood by policy. A lot of that time that means just translation of words and, and so originally we have the, um, the non-pharmaceutical non interventions um, that, that got changed to social distancing uh, and then became behavioral and social interventions but by and large they're now called lockdown or current measures. Uh, as a shorthand and, and, and the reason for that kind of progression through different acronyms or different names is partly a, is trying to find a common language between uh, the people setting the policy uh, or advising the policy and the people who are, who are working on the on the scientific background is to just develop that common language between them i'll miss out that so then the the other issue is the time periods. There's again this, this rapid time period, deciding which populations we're deal, dealing with, uh, what the scope of those questions are. And so one of the words that I've, I've come across in, which I hadn't, um, but I have done in the past um, couple of months is something called a battle rhythm. So the battle rhythm is the idea that you, you create a, a chain that can go from a, um, evidence to advice to decision making in a way that is coordinated rather than um, uh, chaotic um, and this has taken some time to sort out you can imagine that in the early early february that um, as spy m was being stood up as sage was being started as civil servants were being brought into those secretariats uh, and introduced into the, the process that um, there was inevitably um, you know people who, who arrived in, in an organization in one minute uh, and then sort of next minute were being handed responsibility for developing something getting that battle rhythm is actually critically important in, into getting all of these different disciplines and different spheres working together uh, to, to, to produce the, um, the necessary um, decisions and the necessary action. So as far as SPIM is concerned, we receive commissions from the government, various arms of government. We then have to translate those into modelable problem, modelable problems that gets then devolved out into the different members of SPIM who, who offered to do it. Um, it then comes back um, and we agree a consensus. So SPIM works um, by agreeing a consensus, what it is that we think the evidence is, and there is a language around how to express that as uncertainty. Um, so making sure that, that when we think something is highly likely and we 
sort of convey that to SAGE as being something that we think is highly likely, that, that we all know what highly likely means um, and the certainty with which we hold that view, all that language has to be agreed. Um, that then goes to SAGE and, and I and other members of SPIAM, I represent SPIAM, other members sit on, um, um, of SPIAM sit on SAGE um, and that is discussed, um, the evidence that we produce and turned into advice um, and then that goes to, um, to back to government. Quite rightly, I think, and I've, you know, it's, this is the kind of set down as being a major part of, of the way in which the science policy is organized in the United Kingdom. That evidence that we produce is essentially public. Um, and so the documents that we produce go to uh, are public and, and we encourage members to, to publish as much as possible their work. But then the advice that comes out of SAGE and goes to, goes to ministers isn't public. And I think that's quite reasonable that, that um, the decision maker ought to get the first bite of the cherry, if you like, rather than read what the advice is in the, in the media um, um, before they, they've seen it um, any other way. So that, that process, I think, I think works by and large, and, and I, I think it has worked throughout. So just a, a couple of slides about where I think we are. So we have um, two, essentially at the moment, two dynamic regimes we can be in. One of the things about this pandemic, which I think has been um, quite remarkable is the, is the fact that this reproduction number, even though it's miscalled a rate, but it is a number, as Bob May would have said, um, the reproduction number, um, has become, um, you know, a, something which I think um, many people in, in general population and certainly the media uh, like to worry about, and quite rightly so, because if that number is bigger than one, if each case gives rise to more than one other case, we are in exponential growth, um, and uh, we end up with a huge number of cases and deaths, um, which uh, uh, overwhelm the services. Uh, um, health services um, and uh, tragically result in large numbers of people dying of COVID or we hit this number is less than one in which case we will see an exponentially decreasing numbers of cases. What we haven't done to date um, and is poses a real challenge I think is to point is to get across the idea that R being equal to one represents a neutral stability so that whatever number of cases we we have will remain at that level so if we have a thousand people infected and the r is one then the next generation will be a thousand and so on but that is true if we have 10 cases or we have 100,000 cases um I, I don't i think i could foresee a challenge getting that across we have also those people working on household models will know that there's some called r star which is essentially the reproduction number between households um, and there's a next generation matrix that if you have two populations that you worry about an r in in one and the other then of course you've got two other r's which represent the transmission between those those um, populations um, um, and so that's again another challenge for us to to start talking about I think in the in the coming weeks. So the current situation the prevalence in the UK is about 200,000 prevalent cases of COVID and incidents if you divide that by 10 just say well a um, infection lasts around 10 days then you end up with a daily incidence of about 20,000 cases and we're in that kind of ball ballpark uh, the data are coming in to enable us to estimate those much more um, finally, but but that's roughly where we are. And are roughly about 10% of the population have already been exposed. So we're still very early in this epidemic. Um, we, we're into this, this um, phase where, where the heterogeneity is going to become increasingly important. It's already there, um, but if um, we're able to keep basic reproduction number less than one, um, for prolonged periods of time, so then that heterogeneity will, will become increasingly important. And that's where we're going. If, if we keep ours, our below one, then we're going to end up with small, increasingly disconnected sub-epidemics. If our goes bigger than one, 
um, and it's government policy to try and keep it below one. But if it goes bigger than one, then it's hard, very hard to see that there is any um, way backwards other than to imposing some more some kind of lockdown to break up those networks um, to try and reduce it again um, but the end point is undefined we, we we honestly don't know where we're going on and how this whole thing is going to be played out there are some people who will say that this disease will become endemic on the other hand there are countries that which we which are moving towards elimination um, so it remains to be seen Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Graham. Lots of interesting thoughts. I wonder if we have any question from the floor from the participants. We um, do. They, they can. Brilliant. So, um, so one question: How much is known about networks during travel and shopping? How much do we know about people's behaviours and repeat behaviours and those kind of scenarios no so i should have put public transport on that slide as well i mean it, it's again something which we 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 know we have some information in terms of we know what how long far people commute but we don't have any what we have what we lack principally is those extra connections so you know are, are there some schools where people will go on public transport to or children go to transport to a lot are there some workplaces where people go to transport more than others um, are there distances to where people will tend to go more than trans on, on public transport? Um, so that's something, again, which um, information will hopefully accrue um, in, the, in the coming weeks. We'll understand a lot more about that. Shopping, again, that's something which is, as far as I know, there's very little information in terms of collected about, in terms of disease control. On the other hand, there is an awful lot of information about shopping in terms of, of what people spend and where people go and why they go there. Um, and so using that information is, is again going to be important. Thank you. And then as a, a sort of a related question, you talked about core groups, which is kind of a, a concept that we're familiar with in epidemiology, the people who are driving the transmission or the, or the contact patterns that are driving transmission. You mentioned that you know they were they're different in the early stages of an outbreak than later what do you think are the main transmission groups at this point and has there been a big change over the last few weeks uh, it's a very good question so at this point in time as, as we are now i think we what we know is that um a lot of infection is within the care home sector and a lot of infection is within um, the healthcare sector and so they are essentially the the major groups who have of key workers who are still interacting with each other um, and so they at the moment are the core group and we've kind of forced them to be a core group by making everybody else stay at home um, so um, as people stop staying at home in the future they, they will increasingly become less of a core group but at the moment they are core group um, i think it's a very good question though at the initial stages of of, of the epidemic um, so in early February or, um, in the UK, um, I don't think we know exactly who that core group was. Um, and so we would need to, um, you know, potentially the serology as it, as it starts to accrue will tell us where most infection um, has occurred. Thank you. And thank you for this stream of questions I'm getting from the floor. So thank you for them. So, could teachers who are contacting children of key workers at the moment act as sentinels to understand something about the role of children in transmission? Um, yeah, so the, all the information that I am, the best of sort of information, another feature of pandemics or epidemics like this is that by and large you start to, with evidence that tends to be very anecdotal um, and you know, as you're grappling around to know in any information at all, the good anecdote um, does actually hold, carry an awful lot of, um, beg your pardon, carry an awful lot of weight. Um, and so that was the secretariat phoning me, I'll call them back in a minute. Um, carry an awful lot of weight because, because of the lack of information. So a lot of the understanding that we have about the role of children um, has come from small studies or good, good anecdotes, but 
they do seem to be the current current understanding is that children um, are not playing a key role in transmission in this pandemic uh, unlike pandemic influenza where we would expect them to be a core group and, and a key role in this um, and that in terms of teachers that actually data from Australia suggests that teachers are very good at transmitting to each other but less good at transmitting to the children um, so the staff room potentially is, is a, kind of a, a, a bigger hub of transmission than, than the classroom. Um, we, we're still watching that space very closely. The schools in other countries have started to return and clearly we'll be watching those very carefully. I mean, countries are going to learn an awful lot from each other by watching each other and other countries will learn a lot from us by, by what happens, what we do and, and, the, and the consequence of it. Um, the, the concept of using people as sentinels, I think, would be something that, that we would very swiftly pass on to, to SPY B, the behavioural subgroup, um, to be something to see whether or not that would, or how that would be accepted by the public, potentially. Thank you. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how your, the analytical results from SPY M uh, will be put in the public domain or how that has happened or how that may happen in the future? So my understanding is that all the papers that we produce um, and there are a lot of them at each meeting I think I think the last the meeting we had this morning we had something like 30 papers um, tabled uh, they all will all get eventually released by SAGE uh, by the ghost on the Go Science website there, as you say, we encourage the SPIAM members where possible to publish, but we're working on this, this rapid turnaround for policy to, to actually sort of help decision makers, provide them with the evidence. Um, that publication becomes quite difficult in, in that timescale, um, but, but eventually it will, will all be available. Um, and the members of SPIAM are independent experts and are able to you know, output the information and, and the data that they have and the results that they have in any way that they see fit. I'm just going to slightly interpret the question a bit more because it seems like some numbers come out and uh, immediately and others don't. So can you tell us a bit about which estimates get sort of taken forward and put in the public domain more quickly? And whether uh, yeah, I mean, that's really a decision for the, for the way in which um, government wants to do it. Um, those, those numbers, um, as I say, the, the numbers that we produce as a SPIAM consensus gets, gets sent to SAGE and, and, and then they, they are propagated um, through government. Um, I, I, I think we are feeling our way through this whole process. I mean, I'm, I'm not really in a position to be able to talk about that process because I have no control over it and I just know what happens. Those numbers that we give to SAGE will eventually come out, but I appreciate that there is a delay. Thank you. And I think we all appreciate how hard everybody's working on that panel. So I think it's just uh, for people who aren't in those panels, just trying to understand uh, what kind of things go on. And so I've got another couple of questions really about that kind of process. So what sort of things did the epidemic modelers take for granted that came as a, a surprise to policymakers? Do you have any examples of that? Um, it's a very good question. Um, I think an awful lot. I think that um, the 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 modelers on, you know, gen generally infectious disease modelers have an intuitive understanding of the way in which the dynamics work, which is just not shared um, at all by, by pe other people. And I think that's part of the policy science gap and part of the translation um, is that I can, um, you know, use words and concepts, which for me are, are you know, third nature and um, I, they, they meet with blank faces um, so that um, the th that it's very hard to think of a specific example because in fact it's a daily occurrence and I guess related to that because uh, epidemiologists have this understanding of the system uh, from a sort of a th more theoretical point of view I suppose some would say but how much scope do the panelists of SPYMO have to recommend options or policy options that, that haven't been specifically asked in a question that's been put to them? 
Yeah, that normally comes in terms of the feedback that we give to questions that we are asked to, to look at. So specific policies which uh, we do model and we do address and then feedback and say, well, that's the answer to this question, but actually a much better question is this one. Um, um, I think that's, you know, a, a part of the proper process um, that, that there is some kind of backwards and forwards. The trouble with it is that there is because it has to go up through government and come back through government, that process can often take a long time. So you do end up by actually creating a network whereby there are ways in which people throughout different branches of government can contact each other and contact me and say, well, we're thinking of doing this, what do you think? And then I can informally ask people around SPAEV and say, what do you think about that? Um, and so try and shortcut and speed up that process. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's huge scope for it, um, but, but, but kind of informally rather than formally. And, uh, one more question I think about spy and process that we have here is, is what's the sort of forward looking commitment in terms of open science and reproducible code, et cetera, accepting what you were just saying about how busy everybody is. Um, mm. You know, what are the sort of underlying principles you're trying to move towards and what support do you, do members of SPIAM need in that? And, or, you know, yeah. how's, how's that? So the, the work of SPIAM is, is, is supposed to be transparent and it's supposed to be open. Yeah, with the evidence is in the public domain. So that any delay in getting that work out is entirely caused by the fact that before you've done it, there are another three questions that are being asked. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I, but it is, it is happening. I think most of the modeling groups now um, have um, at least have preprints and, and many of the modeling groups have put code, made code available um, and, and published onto GitHub. Um, so that, and other, other um, repository, code repositories are available. Um, and so that, um, yeah, that's, that's the, the pro, the pro, the only, kind of constraint for that is whether or not people want to do it um, because sometimes you're asked to do little bits of analysis which are really unpublishable but contribute um, to the discussion and to the evidence that we produce um, we, we try and make sure that that we have at least two or three models modeling results contributing to every kind of piece of evidence that we put forward so that we we're not just relying on one model um, and sometimes that means that, that people are doing work which is essentially unpublishable um, in, in that form. Um, but aside from that, uh, it's really just the, the fact there are only 24 hours in the day. Thank you. Um, it's a question about international collaboration. So how important will international collaboration be in helping us determine the long term viable strategy? And importantly, is do you think the long-term global strategy is going to be management or elimination given the challenges around elimination and your experience working on other diseases like leprosy um, and neglected tropical diseases thinking about elimination so that really i think the question of elimination or management really very much depends on the biology of the virus and on the intervention tools that get developed um, if if the virus turns out to induce a solid lifelong immunity then obviously that makes elimination much more likely than if um, it doesn't and, you're, and reinfection is possible. Um, and immunity is only temporary or partial. Um, if, if the if vaccine is produced that, that is able to generate lifelong solid immunity, then again, that, that puts it into an, into an eliminatable realm. Um, but um, I think that is too early to say um, whether, to what extent elimination or management is going to be the right way forward. Um, I think that that's something that we will probably be thinking about, you know, potentially later this year or early next year. And what about the international collaboration aspect of that? Mm. You know, how, how have you seen that developing or? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think, in fact, what an Australian colleague said to me right at the beginning of the epidemic, in each country is going to find its own way through this that each country has its own kind of cultural um, and and regulatory backgrounds and social interactions which means that no there is no going to be no one answer to this that once we've gone into this situation where these non-pharmaceutical interventions or behavioral and, and social interventions have become the principal management tool that we have 
they will operate in different countries in different ways at different times. Um, so, so there will be international co collaboration and cooperation in terms of trying to understand the epidemiology and, and hopefully doing the modeling as well. Um, but I suspect that each country will have to find its own way through, um, you know, from now until whenever the end is. Okay, I'm gonna thank you for that. Those thoughts. I'm gonna finish um, with two questions. Uh, the first one is: What lessons can we take from the communication of pandemic models to the general public over the last um, weeks and months, as epidemiological modelers or communicators of science? Um. It's a very interesting question, and I don't really think I can answer it because I'm, um, I haven't thought about it at all. Um, I don't know. I, I, think, I think as somebody kind of, if you like, inside trying to communicate out, I'm probably the wrong person to answer that, but, but absolutely somebody on the outside who was trying to be communicated with has probably got a much better answer to that. Personally, I've, I've found um, social media to be a combination of both excellent way of disseminating information um, and, um, and, 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 you know, a, a, route, a route into to not some of the less, less pleasant sides of life. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. Well, thank you. Thank you for trying. And then I'm going to ask you one more question re related to... Uh, I'm, I'm our, very uh, used to saying I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So um, one of the other questions I didn't ask you is what's the biggest mistake that uh, modelers make when they're first interaction of policy? But I'm aware that we're running out of time. So I may ask you to uh, maybe tweet about that later. Uh, but my it's, final just, question it's just that one. failure to understand that, it, that the answer, you know, by the end of by 5 p.m. at the end of the day, which is which is half, you know, is accurate, but but very uncertain is better than the answer that's nine o'clock the following morning. Um, which is much better. And then linked to that, if we have one week with all these fantastic scientists and mathematicians uh, working on a workshop this week uh, at the INI, what's the one question you'd like them to work on? Oh, the dynamic networks. Yeah. Yeah. The, the net, uh, you know, the networks of, of places and people and contacts, and how how those might get formed. And the and particular threshold danger points that we should be looking out for, mm -hmm. you know, is there is there some warning signal that that tells us when we're starting to get high sort of um, most of the no, most of the people being drawn into the network or or large components start to appear? Um, is is there some some way in which we can evaluate networks mm -hmm. from easily gatherable data? Um, Nice, easy question. Thank you, Graham. I'm sure we'll have that one solved by uh, five o'clock tomorrow. Um, actually, the teams had already identified that this afternoon, so you, it's as if there's a, a nice segue between the two. So thank you very much. We'll keep you in touch with the outputs from the week. So I'm going to wrap up now because we're a little bit over time. So I'm going to say thank you again, Graham. We really appreciate your time and all those interesting thoughts and for setting us some questions for the rest of the week. Thank you again to the Institute team for making this possible and all of their support and rapid turnaround on requests. Thank you to the audience for your attention and for the very good questions. And I think we'll wrap it up there and say good night to everyone and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.